Hello and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Triana, your moderator. I welcome you to the FPU uh, Public Speaker Series. Today, we have a special guest, Dr. Yanti, who is a researcher in the Center for Tech Toxicology and Health Risk Research of the Faculty of Science, Health Sciences, University of Bangsa, Malaysia. And her basic training was on the natural sciences that covers ecology and biodiversity before focusing on the human anatomy. And then she is now a senior lecturer of the, at the Biomedical Science Program. Her current research areas topics on the climate change education modules for schools is on the climate change and impacts of the environmental degradation on children's health and well-being, visual neuro, uh, neurosciences, low electromagnetic field exposure, effects uh, in the nervous system using the animal models. She is recently was invited to ISIS Praxis, a discussion on the human cause of climate change earlier this month. So without further ado, please welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Yanti. Hi, good, Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon, uh, Dr. Yanti, um, could you... Um, start your presentation on today's topic on the youth as ambassador climate climate change ambassadors okay um do i have to share my uh okay thank you uh thank you dr triana um hello everyone my name is yanti and i try not to take so much of your time uh but this is a very um important issue and uh, I know it's a long holiday, so please bear with uh, with me for this um, sharing. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we know that um, we're having climate change at the moment. We are facing the climate change. And um, I specifically mentioned there, uh, we need Malaysian youth to step forward uh, to be our climate change 
education ambassador. And while I was doing the ambassador, when I mentioned the word ambassador, I thought that it's a bit, wee bit too formal and um, or too oldies. So I was thinking, let's use the term heroes so that it sort of like it, it's um, bridged the gaps because being youth, you know, um, heroes is um, something that you can more relate to of. Now, um, when we, um, and when we, to start off, okay, okay well, what I'm going to do is today is that I'm going to start off by explaining what is actually climate change. But before we step into climate change, um, we got to be able to differentiate what is actually uh, climate change, right? Now, uh, climate change, uh, we start, uh, the basic of understanding what is climate change is that if we could actually differentiate what is weather and the the next term is climate okay now um weather is uh what do you call this a when we refers to conditions like rain was it sunny outside or windy so um according to the uh hours or uh, whenever it happens during the day okay so for example when we look outside the window are we looking the weather how's the weather like okay um but but uh the term oh let me if i forgot to click here um the term climate then refers to the average weather and conditions over a longer period of time so we are not talking about hours we're not talking about days we are not talking about weeks we are talking over over a long period of time so basically we are looking into epoch it could be 10 uh, years or a decade or over a few decades. So that's climate and it's in an average weather condition. Okay. So um, sometimes you you may bump into people asking like, so why are we so concerned about this climate change? Like how many people died because of uh, last year because of climate change? So when we have that kind of questions, we know that the person who is asking are not very clear about what is weather and climate and uh, uh and sometimes some people tend to make it into like give me numbers or give me percentages about what is the occurrence uh over something that's for example because of the climate change for example we're talking about flood uh, so you know we can actually mention how many people actually um uh becomes becomes victims to the to the flood, okay. Some of some uh, how X percent of people, uh, sorry, X number of people died because of last year um, so and so flood. But we can't do so when when it comes to climate change because we will be talking about the number of occurrence according or uh, um, what do you call this over average over the years or effect. So weather and climate. So climate is something that you looked over. Uh, you look at the average weather conditions over the uh, epoch, okay, over an epoch of 10 years, 20 years or 30 years. So what then? What is climate change then? Now, climate change is a statistically significant change. So in the state of climate climate, okay, weather, average weather. So what? Uh, then we looked into, is it statistically significant? The change is the is the change statistically uh, 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 significant, and the, that persists. These changes persist over an extended period of time. It may be decades or longer. So it's not only that the normal occurrence, the number, how many times it occurs. Not only that we're talking about the average, but we want the climate change refers to a statistically significant change. So when this uh, climate change is reported, is happening, that is something that we really have to pay attention about because it is a statistically significant change that occurs, that persists over an, ex uh, over an extended period of time. And it's happening everywhere, it's uh, happening globally. So, you know, you can find reports um, based, uh, even if you just Google it, you can find it. It's happening everywhere. Malaysia is not as, uh, is not uh, exempted. Malaysia's uh, climate is also changing. So our um, 
our meteorologists, our scientists have found that uh, as for now, Malaysia is, uh, is uh, what do you call it, uh, experience a longer wet spells than become, um, and this wet spells, rain, rainy seasons, were expected, were projected to be longer. And then, not only that, the dry spells, the, the, our, our dry season is also getting shorter. So um, we were meaning that we were expecting more floods. We be probably expecting um, more um, more torrential rains. So so what is it that we need to do about it? So how are we going to prepare for it? There's so many things that uh, you know, so many uh, agencies looking at the problem based on these reports. But as for today's talk, what I'm going to share with you is that how is this going to be impact, how is this going to impact the children, Malaysian children per se, okay? Now, as for now, uh, we found that with the amount of wet spots we have, we have more floods, we also have the rising sea levels. We are kind of lucky in a sense that because of our geography, we do not have islands that is disappearing okay uh, by the rising sea at the moment we are good um, but we know it's coming right if you can see if you can um, there are reports about jakarta is actually sinking uh, a few centimeters over a year and then uh, there are islands we lost uh, uh, islands were actually now underwater as uh, you know on the eastern part of the what do you call this um uh, uh, on the east part, we are talking about the Oceania Islands there. So that haven't happened in Malaysia just yet, but we know it's coming, and we are, we know we should be doing something about it. We should be worried about it. So and then by um, uh, this rising of sea levels, uh, the also temperatures, and then also the fact that when we have shorter um, shorter dry spells, right? It will then affect our availab availability of food and water as well in Malaysia. In certain areas in Malaysia, it's already prone with um, dry spells, Kamarau, we have limited, uh, they have limited access to fresh water, uh, especially those in the islands. So this is going to be a major problem for them. Right. And also by 2030, it is expected that by a quarter of Malaysia's population will then be displaced because of this climate change. And 2030 is not too far away. It's just an eight, uh, eight years away. So it is something that we should start be concerned about. But uh, and we should not now uh, we just we shouldn't be thinking that, oh, let the agencies, let the uh, so and so ministries take care of it. Um, what? We, I would like to share now is that we should create the awareness and we should also change our ways in order for us to, we may not be able to stop it, but we could perhaps slower things down, okay, this degradation. Now, uh, most of this, uh, the findings that I'm going to share with you is from our previous research. It is head by Promazura, uh, Promazura. Um, UKM and we also been collaboration with UMS and also with UITM and uh, we come out and uh, this research is actually sponsored by UNICEF and because we were interested to see we know that climate change is happening how is this uh, uh, UNICEF is actually wanting to hear or wanted to know how is this climate change is going to impact the children Malaysian children and um, how prepared are they how uh, are they aware of it um, you know, what is their current perception of climate change? That's what, um, you know, this that research was, car was carried out. It was carried out in 2020 and that is completed in 2021. So um, we actually went to different parts of Malaysia to interview, to, um, to find um, inputs from different population in Malaysia. Okay, that includes the um uh what do you call this uh uh what do you call this um vulnerable children from different population okay so we found that uh 
uh, you know, as, as many other reports have already mentioned, globally, climate change is a global emergency. They actually declared that climate change is a global emergency where everyone has to be aware that this is an emergency and it has not only that it will then pose a problem to um, the communities, to the people, but then for those people's uh, generate, uh, population who um, experience uh, difficulties already, for example, the, um, uh, the one who has less income, low income, will then experience this more. So it placed additional stresses on the availability of clean water, clean air, and also food. Okay, And um, this, in Malaysia, not only that we have the impact of climate change, we also have um, the problem of, you know, uh, we have our own set of problems. For example, we have environmental pollution in the air. Uh, we have uh, environmental pollution uh, uh, in the water previously. So this is going to impact, uh, the impact will be experienced disproportionately by children in Malaysia, depending on where they are, where they are growing up, okay, and also their environment. So, Everybody is uh, vulnerable, but then the impacts associated with it would be felt differently. Okay, so but basically, we found that children under five in Malaysia, um, eighty-eight percent of them will feel the burden of diseases that because of this climate change. Okay, so uh, this is something that uh, another reason that we should really uh, be aware of the seriousness of the matter. Um, I don't want to bore you with the, um, the how this climate change is going to affect. But then the key point here that I want to show to you, share with you, is that um, they uh, the children are impacted in many ways, either directly or indirectly. And, um, you know, uh, like, for example, we have floods. We, be, we have cases where children drown uh, in big floods, okay? And then uh, we also uh, come... Uh, we also... Uh, this sorry, this figure also explain about how the food availability will also be um, scarce during the extended period of droughts. So in certain certain areas, okay. So key point here is that children uh, are affected in many many ways uh, uh, on uh, because of climate change and also not to, as I said just now. In addition to the um, environmental degradation also happening in Malaysia. So um, from this, from that research, we can we can say that there are risks to children' well-being. So that included the waterborne diseases linked to floods. So when that flood happens, right? So not uh, the issue is not during directly. For example, the children exposed to the danger of being drowned, but then. After the flood happens, the climate, uh, we can also that children will then experience a high risk uh, of uh, diseases, also injury, and also death. Okay, during that, uh, during the flood. So, and then we also have have, um, have problems when it comes to the um, when it's too dry. So we have air pollution problems where we have less movement of uh, air. Okay, we have. Uh, uh, when it's so stale and not, not as windy. So we have children in certain, certain, for example, we had studies, we can show data in, in Sarawak and also in Kota Kinabalu. When his happens, right, uh, the children actually admitted, uh, we have more children admitted to the hospitals due to the infection of the respiratory tract uh, or the, what do you call this, also um, suffering from asthmatic um, problems. And then not only that, the other risk that's for children is that we have vector-borne diseases, for example, like malaria and dengue. Now, when we when I say just now that the scientists has found that we have longer dry uh, wet spells and shorter dry spells, right? Um, it also affects the um, the development or I say this life cycle of the insects. For this matter, we life cycles of the mosquito, um, but Cleverly, clearly, this um, this is this mosquito uh, that we uh, the scientist has reported that rather than to 
per perish because of the climate change. What they did is, you know, something actually very clever in terms of their life cycle is that they changed their life cycles so that it coincides with during the changes so that they can still be viable and be able to live. So therefore, because of this, we have more cases of dengue and malaria. Now, dengue is an urban disease, so and particularly affects children in, and also the young adults. And this also causes concerns to us. Okay. Now, what happened? We're having all that in general setting. But when it comes to the marginalized population, uh, what we have come across, the children in the islands, uh, staying in the islands in the coasts of Sabah, we also have uh, our group of studies from children um, that uh, the or from the orang asal the um, aborigines not, uh, we call it orang asal and these are the Timia people but uh, from a location in Perak I may not I may be uh, be blunt here we may not be able uh, be seeing the whole or uh, this group that we studied may not represent the whole of uh, orang asal's uh, actual condition, but this is just a representative from the population that is staying in a remote area, right? So, and also, we also looked at the um, children look uh, staying in the PPR area in the, um, in the city of Kuala Lumpur. But we found that these three uh, marginalized communities is that these uh, climate change and also the burden of this environmental degradation adds vulnerability vulnerability to the marginalized group because they then adds to the susceptibility of infectious diseases and then they also impacted in terms of the access to schools and education and also impacted impacted on the access to basic services for example hospitals in uh, during in cases where we have uh, bad uh, weather, uh, when people have to travel from the mainland to the islands of in Sabah to get, uh, they, you know, they were they will not be able to get uh, medical services uh, on time in the case of emergency, for example. Okay, and then they also have a general health hazard on top of the general well-being, and also um, also not. Uh, also, a big matter is that it affects the, affects the family income instability. So um, then, will then uh, also adds to the fact that you know it affects on the children per se. Although that we have the, you know, we have Mal in Malaysia we have these uh, acts and we have these policies that protects the the the, the Malaysian children, and uh, we looked into how the um, you know how education is impacted. We look into how the, the availability of food and the level of obesity, level of um, um, food supply, and also to the um, uh, enrollment to schools level uh, to education uh, and, and poverty. So we look at that and then we found that um, Malaysian children is doing, uh, is, I mean, uh, is well protected. It's not that we don't say that, um, you know, we do not have anything, uh, you know, for them. We do. We, we do have acts. We have policies for them uh, that covers in general. But the problem is that children is not addressed as a specific target group. Okay. Okay. Um, so we discovered, but then it's just a general, uh, it's just referred to a general population. And these do not address where in cases where children's cis bodily system, bodily system is not actually ready or it's not actually fully developed yet. So, um, for example, the um, levels of air pollution of X and X may be hazardous to uh, uh, you know, SNS may be okay for the adults, but it may not be okay for young children because they have smaller, you know, they have uh, developing um, body system. So that may not be able to cope the ones that the ones adults are doing well. So we do not have um, that uh, opportunity where children is addressed uh specifically so it is lumped together and looked into as a general population 
So um, this lack of avenues for children's participation or representative will then um, uh, will uh, sort, of, uh, sort of like uh, we do not have enough data, enough perception. Uh, we do not listen to these children enough. Although that we do have um, we do have children representative representative, uh, uh, for example. Um, about 30 children age uh, to 13 and 17, but then they are more confined towards education and then, um, you know, to certain, certain parts, health, okay? But um, for education, uh, for climate change education per se is something very new and that have yet to start, okay? Uh, start or to be taken off uh, very well. So there is, there is some niche that can be actually refined a bit more and perhaps we have more representative. So apart from that, we find that, okay, our key finding for that is that Malaysian children are reasonably good access to their rights, okay? They have, uh, that is for their education, for their health, for their well-being, for their safety. But this varies according to the societal and also where they are located, their geographical condition. So we do with as with our accelerated climate change, environmental degradation, second thing, and pollution, right? So Malaysian children is impacted. Okay. And children, those children living in the marginalized communities are uh, more vulnerable to climate change and environmental risk. And then it also X uh, impacted differently on gender. And then um, although we have some attempts of government Malaysia, Malaysian government framework to engage with climate and environment issues, um, but this being on children has yet been adequately considered. So that's what I said uh, we found that, you know, what else can we do now? Now, on top of the fact that we have ministries working and on their you know, carry out the responsibilities. We should also start locally, okay? If everyone could actually start doing their bits to lessen the impact, to slow the impact of climate change, we should be able to see some improvement. Now, Malaysian youth has been reported about, uh, worried about climate change. And, uh, you know, we, they have, uh, we have individuals we have NGOs, we have groups, we have collaboration, uh, co uh, collaborating um, societies working with the government sectors and also the NGOs try to sort this out, right? But um, as uh, and but that we we need to give more support to these kind of activities. So um, why why is it that we are so interested in youth? Why would I not say that? Why not we concentrate on the adults? Okay, so we would say that because youth acts as a bitch. And if you can have a look here, we can see that the youth actually is the biggest population uh, in Malaysia at, at the moment. Let me just look at this one. Uh, uh, at the moment, we have about, um, about 60% of Malaysians are in the youth um, brackets. Okay, and this is based on the 2022 uh, current population estimates. So we have this huge group of, um, of of population that could work as an enabler, could work as a hero, could work as ambassadors. You know, um, on the uh, on capacity on the individual capacity and also working as a group, right? To actually engage with the society and maybe share the awareness. So we want to create the awareness because I think the youth are actually very well aware, but we have some, perhaps some older generations, perhaps they're aware of it, but they don't know how they can contribute. And also the young children, because we concentrate on the young children because we find that, you know, the children one day will then inherit this planet. So, and then, uh, and this would be, um, this would be, um, you know, better for them to address the problem that may come earlier. And we make them realize about it. And then, um, you know, we can educate them how to go about it with this uh, issue of climate change. Now, um, if you can see, uh, you know, I'm quite sure that every one of you um, have heard about Greta Thunberg and about it. She's a 
very young um, uh, climate change campaigner and it started off uh, um, in Sweden in 2018 and that is when she's only 15. Okay, so also in, in the Glasgow um, last, last year, uh, she also mentioned that, um, you know, some areas are not, in her opinion, uh, in the youth opinion, are not addressed properly or, you know. So that is where I think we could uh, perhaps emulate the, uh, you know, um, because this group, uh, the, the youth actually in Malaysia, are more IT CV. So you have more information. You have you have all these informations that could actually be made use, could be channeled to a better um, you know, to, to be to be listened to. So as for now, these are the example, I mean for the key um, um, uh, Malaysians. So for example, we have Toziki, we have also society like uh, Eco Knights, okay, who actually uh, this is just example, we have many, many more, okay, who actually um doing something to address the climate change right to create awareness so um we have many steps in creating the awareness so for example uh, okay there are many steps in creating awareness so first off is that you have to educate yourself second step is that you can work together identify the issues and then work which one is that that you like to address first that can be actually um model uh, to the where you are, where the where you are, according to the environment, according to the population, and then actually the next step is to work with the community. So if we um, if we take this as a general model, okay, um, is that the first step is to actually get to know with the uh, get to know with the issue ourselves, okay. First of all, we start with the individual one, so we start being uh, we would like to realize that, uh, you know, we need to realize that we need to be aware of uh, aware ourselves, um, what and how much we can do. We get to identify the issues, right? We, we got to create the uh, deeper awareness, right? And uh, after that, we have to, we can work with others and with similar interests and uh, to make the change. And then we can actually identify what is the bigger problem, what is the something that will be addressed soon. And and I would say that this is where we need the youth to to, to test ambassadors because um, we cannot find a solution. We cannot create or we cannot suggest something or a specific module, for example, um, to be used as, uh, as a blanket or to be used everywhere all over Malaysia, perhaps, because it may not be suitable depending on the population that um, the youth is in. So this is where I said... Um, um, it is good to the fact if the fact that the youth actually work together in their in their population in their society, and then actually create that actually whatever works for them and tackle the issues that's affected them most. Right. So work with others and then design the change. Maybe you could start, for example, by educating. Uh, what is it and, and uh, what is climate change? What is what do we uh, need to do? Uh, if you and so if you are so and so age, perhaps the way you communicate with the uh, for to create awareness with the society members is also different. Maybe when you communicate to our parents, our the older generations, um, you know we have to um, can show them the the impact of certain actions that. Actually Actually, cause the problem now, and perhaps younger children, you can explain like why is it that they need to be aware of this and tackle it head on, because the younger generations are the ones who's going to stand and experience the climate change the longest, right? So, and then uh, whatever actions that we talk, what we do, we decided we want to work with the society, and we try to make it sustainable, so that you know um, we can just you know continue coming back, working on it, tackling the issues, and um, perhaps we we can tweak it here and there, and then to make it sustainable, so that the people could actually continue doing it, you know, like uh, continue doing it with that awareness. And then, in for the and uh, and how do we know that the society or community actually is ready for that, or is already um, what do you call that um, um, 
they can do on their own, carry on their own, is that even when you leave, when you remove yourself or remove the society, you uh, okay. Um, this community can actually continue the work or the awareness that you have created. So make it sustainable. So um, I would like to give you back uh, to like to stop now. I like to give the audience back to Dr. Chiana. Uh, so I do hope that um, this will then sort of like create sparks um, in your awareness, in your uh, giving you ideas or perhaps what to do next and also perhaps giving back to the uh, the, the bigger uh, society about what you can do or perhaps giving you ideas of what to work on next as a group. Um, yeah, I do hope that's what's happening. Okay, so I leave it to you. I'll give you back and then may perhaps if you have any questions, I would like to, I have to see whether I can answer that. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you so thank much, Sushanti. So this is why we need more public lectures on the sustainable issues. There's so many imports. And today, based on the research findings itself, now we know that and aware of the gap in the demographic group, which is this known as vulnerable group children, is actually the potential driver for tackling the environmental issues. So now let's see. Let's look whether we do have a... Yes, we do have a question from the audience from the pre-event participants. So let's look at the first question. Yes. What are the effects of climate change on the future Malaysian generation? Okay. Um, effects of the climate change of future uh, Malaysian generations, I would say uh, we can have um, the case, okay, that's um, for Malaysian especially, we will definitely experience uh, extreme temperatures. So when we have uh, extreme temperatures, we have uh, many families that's probably uh, on the, you know, at that uh, barrier about uh, between poverty, okay, within that um, brackets. And then uh, mainly people, uh, many families already living in the poverty with less food, less, uh, less food, less clean water, less income, and then worsening health. The reason of the worsening health is some is actually very, very scary because sometimes um, this is that we have parents who are willing not to have or not to eat a lot, not to have much, sorry, not to eat a lot, sorry, let me correct that. We have parents who may sacrifice their portion of food in order for the children to, you know, for the children to consume them, consume them. We also may have um, people uh, who are sick, but that will not seek help because they need to use the the money for, uh, you know, for 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 food. So we have will definitely bring about that problem. And with extreme food, uh, with extreme temperatures as well, we may not be able to grow our food sufficiently. We probably have to import. And when that happens, definitely the food price will, will rise. And then we also have to pay more for our daily, um, you know, expenses. And if we look at the bigger, temp uh, bigger, bigger picture, when we have extreme temperature, it does not affect only Malaysia. It also affects perhaps the whole Asia or, or you know, Southeast Asia, for example. So it may show that for example, if we are lacking of rice, we import from Thailand, we import from, you know, we import from Thailand, for just for example, quick example. So we have import from Thailand. But then what if Thailand is also experiencing that kind of shortages? So that will actually drive the price of food getting kind of higher, right? So um, I know, and for example, there was another simple uh, example is that when, uh, when we have extreme temperature, for example, it's going to be hot, right? Then... Uh, our 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 vegetable growers, our food growers in 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 Cameron Highland may not be able to produce the amount of vegetables that is normally normally we normally you know we can normally find uh, or you know at a good price or a, a variable price, but not be as that anymore. It could be more expensive. So extreme temperatures is one. We could also have uh, the children be impacted in a way that. Their immune system, they're still developing, but uh, now is 
challenged by the uh, diseases and pollution. So we can we have already seen this case. We have seen the trend in in Sarawak especially, and also in Sabah during the haze. You know when we have the the yearly haze um, uh, from from that blown from other country. So um, we can find that the number of children admitted to the hospital because of the respiratory diseases uh, actually spikes. We and that spikes actually coincides with the extreme temperatures. And then we can also find the extreme events, for example, will destroy homes, will destroy schools, where there will also child care center. And that, and also the in, uh, other critical infrastructures that helps to bring up children, perhaps to, you know, provide children good education, good, uh, health support, and that could be destroyed and that will not uh, be corrected immediately, okay? And then also... Yeah, as I said, the drops just now, the droughts and flooding also affected the crops. So again, that will uh, also cuts off the uh, the clean water and um, and this clean water, especially for example in in Pulau Gaya, we found that um, they actually have to pay uh, a lot more for clean water supplies from the mainland. So and. Mm -hmm. If this group of people is already marginalized people, right, marginalized population, so with this longer droughts, uh, extreme heat, right, they definitely have to pay a bit more for water. So not only that they are they don't earn much, some of them, um, they also then have uh, experience, um, you know, have to pay more, fork out a, a bit more for their food and also for their water, for example. Right. Okay. For the second question, is Malaysian current acts and policies not enough to protect the children? Um, okay. For this one, if I could... Um, can I come back to my slide? I just want to show you the two slides that I put in the... Yes, yeah, all right. Thanks. Um, we... Uh, for this, for that study, uh, we actually looked at the policies that we, uh, Malaysian have, and also we looked into the, uh, the, uh, the analysis to the our, our X. Okay, and then I would like what you can see here is that um, we do we do have climate change policies. For example, we have fifteen about them. Environment, we have education on health on children, on children. Yeah, so we do have that, and also the fact that. For this one here, um, we do have on environment, climate change, public health protection, and also child protection. So in terms of education, safety, uh, in terms of education, the children in Malaysia is actually well, um, um, well in uh, doing very well in protecting the children. It's just that we do not have a specific one that uh, when it comes to climate change because the children actually were actually um, considered or lumped together as a um, as what do you call it as a general uh, adults right mm -hmm. so we do not have anything that specifically for children just yet just yet but I'm quite sure that um, you know the our government, our, our military is aware of that, and they are doing it. I think they are they are taking actions in in addressing these issues. Some sort of segmentation, yeah, yeah. But or, then, uh, my yeah. point being here is that they are doing their bits, right? But hmm. we, uh, the the youth, should also start creating awareness that, you know, that um, the, that to, to the children and also creating awareness to the society that some have to change. For example, I'd like to share uh, um, uh, what you call this, um, uh, the ones that we saw in Sabah and Pulau Gaya. Again, I'd like to give the example in Pulau Gaya. This, we have, I, we have the schools uh, and the school is actually on the, uh, on, on stilts, on, uh, on the, what do you call it? on the water. Right, mm. so the blocks, the blocks are actually on the water, and they are connected with this walkway, port walkways. 
And what's interesting is that uh, about the schools there is that, uh, you know, schools, the Malaysian standard schools are actually supplied with fan with, you know, a good ventilation. Yeah. But mm. for what, for these schools, what they have is that they have extra, um, how do you say, a place, not to say place, I want to say they have their spaces, right? Uh, mm. Open spaces that if mm. it gets too warm during the afternoon, because of mm. course in the right, yeah, it gets too warm in the afternoon because we're talking about sea now. It's, you know, you can imagine the, you know, being, un, uh, being, um, uh, be, being at the sea uh, in the afternoon, right? So this, uh, this so to protect this uh, school children from extreme heat, the school actually has <clears throat> has taken the the you know the responsibility to have an open space uh, for 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 class. Actually, that's that's actually um, very commendable, and so that you know um, it will not be too hot for them, right? And yeah. also the fact that. They have extra windows, extra ventilations. But then again, they have options even when it gets too hot. You can just bring the class outside and have it have it in like an open class, class uh, yes. yeah, open class school in you know above the sea. So it's it's interesting, and the mm. fact that uh, we do not they do not wait for um, you know um, for some uh, what do you call directions directions from you know they just do it um accordingly but what they, during uh, within what they can do so that's one way so it's kind of uh this is something that i said um uh, is there if there's anything that we can do to stop or to slow the impact especially on the children um this is something that we should take on mm. okay so now uh, uh we have um Wait yeah, for a minute. Um, in one point that you mentioned just now is about empowering the community uh, by communicating and create social awareness. So what else that we can do uh, to make this awareness quicker by having in mind that climate change has already happened? Okay. Um, for this one, I would say um, we have to educate people. Mm. We have to have uh, a climate change education, or an a, a, a topic which is um, that that teaches specifically or highlights specific, specifically on how climate change is going to impact on of uh, on us and what are we going to do about it, right? So we need to educate. But then this is what I said: we need to fine tune it according to the our you know uh to, to our client to the ones that we want uh to our audience so we so that we can get it get them to understand get them to aware at their capacity at their level we could not have something that is meant for everyone that is like we are like a template and we we use that template all over it will be very difficult right for example if you say um for those again, um, giving you an example from based on the uh, on our study, you know those community living in an island, and community living in the uh, the the orang as the orang asal community, right? Mm -hmm. So during climate change, right, when it happens, when they have um, where where we have just say for example, we have a scarcity of food, right? Those people, those community in uh uh in in Pulau Gaya, for example. Uh, they cannot, they may not, or may find that planting food, uh, planting, uh, you know, vegetables, uh, whatever, uh, you know, um, vegetable, for example, a simple one, is, is may not be viable for them because they do not have enough land. Some of their houses are already uh, on this, uh, uh, on stilts, on the in the water, right, on the water, so they can't plant, uh, you know, vegetables their own. But then. Uh, and they may then it, they may be impacted. They may feel the impact more. Uh, they can okay. They can rely on the fish. They have proteins, good proteins there. But they mean lack of greens. For those people on the orang asal, they have they are not that impacted as much because they can plant. They can they can uh, you know they can plant their crops. They can you know they can harvest fruits, and then they can also hunt. So mm. this is what I'm saying. Um, 
we um, the the education to educate them or, or you know how to tackle this problem the climate change we have to um, fine tune it we have to um, how to say we have to match it to the audience to their lifestyles to the groups maybe like uh, another community that we have is the PPR group, uh, the one in Purmahan, our Purmahan, um, what do you call this, PPR uh, for the B40s, right? So, mm. and again, they have limited number of, limited uh, place to plant, maybe to plant vegetable in pots perhaps, but then nothing more than that. And then they, even worse, they can't, they can't, they can't plant. So then it is uh, harder for them because they need to buy everything and everything is going to, uh, going to be more expensive. So these are what I'm saying is that they are impacted differently. So if we were to have some sort of climate education, it has to be fine-tuned. Yeah. So the youth, uh, the youth actions, the youth ambassadors is what works best because, for example, we are at the university's community. We have youth there, right? At the community, our students, our students is you know they are they are clever. They are you know they can access to information. They can, given this problem, this society problem, they perhaps they can come up with a solution good for that society. So this is what I'm saying. The youth actions um, is very very uh, needed here. This is why I'm saying that you know because youth are flexible in terms of you know, they get information, they are active, they are, you know, all for it, they are go-getter. So mm -hmm. that's something that they can actually focus on. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, move to another question, which is now, why do you mention youth specifically and why not academics, the leaders or the politicians? I would say I would stick to the fact that the fact that youth are energetic. They are young, they have the energy, um, you know, they only shown that they have the motivation, they have the creativity, they have the passion to play central part in climate responses. You know, unlike, you know, leaders, they have their own things to do. They know, they know the issue and they can tackle in their way. So are the politicians, so are the academics, right? Um, that's why, for example, I said that, for example, like we academics, we do the research. This is what we found out. These are the gaps. And having the youth is possibly, uh, is a possibly a best solution, for example, right? Mm -hmm. But then um, an enabling environment also needs to be youth uh, inclusive so that um, we can hear, we can uh, listen to their ideas and perhaps works together um, and supporting young people's effort towards more climate resilient society and also the fact that um, youth are also uh, in, uh, youth are also vulnerable to climate change okay yeah. and then yeah. this should be recognized in the policy instrument and then therefore the this youth uh, can play as an active agent for change. And this can be, not need to be recognized. And also the fact that uh, youth should also, uh, can also um, bring the specific considerations when it comes to gender, taking into account that we have climate related, social, economic, and also impacted. That is slightly different when it comes to gender. Uh, gender is impacted differently, slightly differently when it comes to um, impact of the climate change. Okay, and decisions to whether or not the girls will continue going to school after big flight, uh, you know, all that. For example, does uh, uh, differs between the communities, and I see, and also the fact that um, um, this education also can be. Um, you know, we have uh, government has a role in shaping the education, fine, but to carry out to uh, 
not only the teachers, but the community should also take part. The parents should also be educated. The younger children, of course, they go to school. They need to be, uh, you know, they learn. But we can be the youth. Uh, we can uh, we can have the youth act as a bridge to these groups, so mm. that the, um, this action, uh, so that we can all take on or tackle this climate change impacts together. Right. Okay. Um, next question. Will the action we take, I believe that you already un, um, talk about this, which is uh, the question is talk, um, ask about the action we take today be enough to present the, to prevent the direct impacts of climate change or is it little too late for it? Little too late will be so good would be so gloom and sound so um would sound so um defensive i would say so you know let's 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 take uh, tackle it like this right let's do our let's take our action now we cannot prevent it but we can slow the, the impact down i think that's the best way to put it right um for uh, youth, right, uh, they can do so much to create awareness. Let the people up there to work on, to take carry on their beats, making, looking at the policies, looking at the acts, right? But then if we could create this awareness, educate, share our passion, uh, take up our responsibility, we recycle, we take care of our rubbish, uh, uh, you know, take care of our rubbish, make sure we, uh, we don't, you know, we don't have uh, rubbish everywhere that clog up the clog up the drain somewhere and then we can, will then cause floods because of this climate change. That is something that we can actually do within our limit, right? So, as I said, I ref would refrain from using too late, but I would say that um, let's take it together now. Mm, yeah, true. So this is, uh, I have another last questions, I believe. In the, Oh, no, I have another three. Right. So, okay, let's, let's continue. Okay. In a, this is a, next question is, in a university environment, how can we guide to develop our students who are interested uh, to be climate education ambassadors? How can we guide? Okay, that's a very good question. Now, um, how can we get? Uh, I'm gonna sound so boring because I'm gonna retract a bit, you know, retract a bit uh, more. Um, I think um, um, as educators, as academics, when we want to create curriculum, right, we have. Uh, you know, we have to do it according to the MQA requirement where we need to um, get, ensure the children, uh, sorry, ensure the students' uh, um, responsibility. Uh, we have the uh, personal and interpersonal skills. They have the communication skills, uh, right? So we have to make sure that we have that skills enhancement uh, or what do you call this? We looked at that skills uh, part, right? Now, so... When we uh, and climate edu uh, edu change education doesn't have may not be a, a separate entity altogether. If we have okay, uh, what do you call that? An elective course, we can actually have a course where uh, we have to we can go to the uh, we can go to the community, we and uh, we find out what is your problem and see we can make that as a project right to tackle the community problem may not we may not be solve it be able to solve it at one go right we but uh, no it's not that we go to the community today we're going to solve their problem that's it done no this is what i said just now the importance of the fourth step the last step is to ensure sustainability right so um the the, the sustainability of the project Perhaps it's best at the university level. Come up with a we can come up with an elective program uh, that work maybe um, uh, a simple one maybe to tackle uh, to create the awareness of uh, um, separating the rubbish 
types of rubbish at home uh, at so and so community right so we can and then we can start with ed- going to the community we learn the setup of the community first we need to see uh, what are the background of this uh, of the of the community or the background as in like are they the ones uh, uh, what type of consumer uh, are they and then what type um, you know um, the education level how much can they go about how much they can um, how much were they willing to uh, to change their ways so all that actually having that background uh, ideas of that 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 community will then be able for you to come back and discuss uh, what is the key points here how to tackle first which are the problems to tackle first so by giving this kind of modules elective course to the children to the to the students right the student will then start thinking will start discussing among them will start uh, identifying the issues we'll find out we'll google more we'll find out more information about this how it is done overseas and perhaps how we can emulate the ones already done in overseas here back in that society they're looking at so you know that is just one example but it also then uh um and for example if you are a you know depending on the the, the program also you can also fine tune perhaps if uh, it's an it program right if you're an it program then perhaps you can help the you know creating brochures about educating the children about educating the adults because maybe the same information you cannot relate the same information to the children and to the adults or to the parents the same way there must be some sort of engagement that you need to do to make them understand deeper so again for example again if it you perhaps you can uh, create brochures create templates create mm-hmm. but then if you are into business maybe you could also advise uh, you know the ones the sellers if they have a local seller there or may not even not be using uh, let's not use plastics for example let's use these for example so those are the things that i said that uh you know youth action could work together tackle a local pro- lo- local uh, problem this one mm. but then having that having that courses will not deviating away from what you're supposed to do because we still follow and you know we are actually enhancing the student actually with their communication skill with their you know looking for uh, informations virtually digitally solving the problems you know uh, so yeah that's why developing their uh, personal and interpersonal skills okay good question actually that one um, so I found out that the, we have another three question, but this three question is actually um, talking about the same thing. Um, let me summarize. I'll try my best to summarize it, um, but I'm just going to choose um, number nine, which is, do you think that taking action on the climate change can make our lives to be better and safer in the present time, or it will only make a difference to the future generation in Malaysia? I would say definitely for the future, but it's also for us now. Yeah. For example, okay, for example, we have the case of flood, big floods, right? Uh, a year, a couple of year, years ago. And then we then uh, we also have this kind of, um, you know, we have immediate actions taken by certain parties that immediate action and that immediate action solve the problem helps the people then then and then okay we also have different parties looking at the problem issue and now they find a bigger way maybe to make sure that i know all the drainage are now scheduled to be cleansed or, or cleared uh, according to some schedules perhaps so that is for the future but then perhaps there are also i'm quite sure of there are also at different sector looking into how do we work how do we coordinate in the case of emergencies and that's definitely mm-hmm. for our future so the next time we have disasters right we have a co a coherent a collaborated acts to face in terms of disaster so i would say it is actually take um, it takes both and 
uh, both both sides now and also for the future generations definitely mm. because we okay. don't want because when that happens that disaster happens right for example like in Aceh for example there's another Aceh is not a climate change thing but that example uh, there's no preparation at the you know at at the country level for uh, for Indonesia at that time to to face that kind of major impact and now they have they have a warning mm. system at the sea or this and that. So that is an example how what happened then helps for the future. So now we are similar like that. We have now in now be aware of when is the flood uh you know information system warning. And I know that there are some uh, part of the agencies are actually working towards that now. Mm. Okay. So I believe this will be our last question for today. All right, from uh, from the audience, what are the advantages does young generation have in a finding solutions to combat the climate change? What advantage? What advantage does young generation in finding solution? Advantage for the young generations, you have a better planet to live in. <laughs> That's one. You have a safer planet to live in now that all the you know all the big issues being tackled and previously we may not be thinking of what is the problem now we know what's the problem perhaps then um now the younger generations um um uh, of a, a, a good privileged young uh, generations i'm not to say there's nothing wrong with being privileged it's good because it shows that we were brought up with our parents work hard for it so but then now uh we probably may not have uh you know we, we by 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 tackling finding solutions right we're actually making us ourselves aware of the current scenario environmental uh, the environment around us we learn to work together uh, we learn how to share informations. We learn how to. Um, uh, we learn how to um, corroborate and also collaborate and also uh, identify. You know, we have the personal interpersonal skill. We develop that so that we can work together. Um, and I, I'm, I'm. It's a huge difference for youth, right? Um, or for example, uh, it's a huge difference. It's uh, something that you can have a hands-on experience, you face yourself, rather than something that you learn through books, through, you know, through 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 journals, articles. So that's something that you will, def uh, you def will definitely benefit of, actually. You will see that your self-confidence will also grow because you know something and you like to help. So, you know... Um, and th those, I think, are, are what do you call this? Are soft skills that's actually beneficial for their lifelong, uh, uh, that's also, also part of your lifelong learning. Okay. I believe that the, uh, the, the answer yet yeah, that um, will sum up of our topics today, right? I would like, uh, would like to thank you so much to uh, Dr. Yanti for, you know, basically accepting our, our invitation uh, in public lecture. So I hope that we can see for other topics in a, in the sustainable area or field, right? Thank you so much, Dr. Yanti, for today, public lecture, right? Okay, thank you. Thank Love you. everyone. Bye-bye.